So today we are tackling the Germans and the Austrians. Um, two of the kind of more important wine regions, but don't really they don't really get the credit they deserve, I feel. Um, so we're gonna try to again change that perception a little bit, change the way people think about these two countries. Obviously, they have their own historic reasons why they might not be popular. Um, but again, they are doing everything they can to change that. So, the Germans. It won't surprise you that historically everything started with the Romans again. Uh, as, you can, as you can tell by now, that's been pretty much the theme for all of the European countries. Um, so I'm actually not going to go into more detail about that. Um, the other important influence in, in European wine were the churches, were the monasteries. And in Germany, this all started with one very particular Schloss, or Schloss is a German word for castle or chateau uh, for French. Um, and Schloss Johannesburg was, well, is one of the most important uh, wine relics in the, in the world of German wine. Uh, basically, it was built in uh, 1100s as a monastery, so the Cistercian monks built it. Um, on top of a hill, they decided that's going to be a great place to grow uh, vines, so they built it there. Uh, the name comes from the John the Baptist. So John in German is uh, Johann. Uh, so Johannesburg, Berg meaning mountain, it was the John's mountain. So that's how the, the Schloss got the name. Um, the reason why it's important, so first of all, it was built in 1100 and they started planting vines straight away uh, as, as the monks. Um, so it was one of the oldest vineyards um, that is still around today. Uh, but the real change uh, came, so the vineyard was destroyed quite a few times actually. First the monastery was destroyed and then it was kind of moved over to, to private hands or at that time royal hands, so a lot of dukes and princes and, and people like that owned it. Um, and that was pretty much the case until Napoleon came down and, and kind of took it everything away. Um, but there was one guy that that bought it in 1716 and he they never rebuilt the monastery instead he built um, this kind of a castle like um, view that we see today and he planted the first riesling vines uh, in germany in 1720 so before that it was just other different grape varieties but this kind of trademark um, the new era the new beginning for for germany and as we, we will learn today, Riesling is pretty much the backbone um, of all of Germany. Um, so they actually still have some bottles from, um, from some of their first vintages. I think they, have, they still have at the Chateau a sealed bottle of 1776 uh, Riesling uh, that is thought to be the last drinkable or the oldest drinkable bottle uh, of white wine in the world um, so you can if you ever go to this place uh, it is just off mines in Germany um, so if you, if you ever go there it's pretty pretty much interesting uh, to have a look at their cellar and see that um, but why do I want to talk about Schloss Johannesburg um, so it's on top of all of these reasoning things they were famous for one more thing so in 1775 so at that time the owner of the chateau had to give permission um, to start harvest and the owner at that time was a, a, a bishop prince sort of thing. Um, so they sent a courier to him to get confirmation whether they can start the harvest and the courier never showed up. I mean, he was late. He came two weeks after the, the grapes were ready to be harvested. Um, the reasons for that are there's a few different legends, a few different stories. One of them was that um, he was kidnapped, the courier, and that he did, wouldn't uh, come back in time. There's a few others, but I like this one about being kidnapped uh, because it makes the most sense to me. Why else would you be too late, two weeks late? Um, anyway, so he was two weeks late to the party, came to the chateau and said, oh shit, now you need to start um, harvesting. And everybody's like, oh, but the grape are, grapes are too sweet. We're never gonna get good wine out of it. Um, so they, they sold the grapes, well not sold, they gave the grapes to the locals, to the farmers, and those farmers made an absolutely amazing wine. It was a little bit sweeter, but it was still fresh. It was still very complex, still very, very interesting. 
Um, and that's how they mistakenly um, figured out that they can harvest grapes very, very late and still get beautiful wine. And this was the start of uh, their late harvest, their Spätleses, their Ausleses, their Beren um, which is kind of the basis of what German wines are today. And we'll get more to those, what they, do, what they actually mean um, in a little bit. But let's go back to kind of the main, main regions of Germany. So I'm sure you all know that Mosul is probably the most important one in terms of Germany. Uh, it's the region right over here, right along the banks of the river. Uh, and it's the, the cradle of German reasoning. So this is where you arguably find some of the most consistently good uh, reasoning. What makes it so special here is that uh, it's planted on very, very steep vineyards right next to the river uh, on slate soil. So slate are these big kind of polished uh, rocks. And the reason why they're important is there's two reasons. One of them is if you'll remember when we talked about phylloxera, uh, it is phylloxera free. And the other reason is that these slates, they're big rocks. And during the day, as the, these rocks warm up, they retain a lot of heat. So while this is quite far north um, in terms of um, being able to grow grapes, this is right at the top um, of the 50th uh, horizontal line, whatever, um, latitude, latitude, longitude, latitude, I think. Um, but they're still able to grow the grapes because of these rocks, because they retain the heat and they keep kind of warming up the grapes at night, preventing them from, from freezing and keep, uh, keeping them developing. Um, so quite a special region. The other region is the other, the other reason is because of these steep steep hills, they get a lot of uh, a lot more sun exposure. Because if you can imagine, if if the the, the grapes are planted like that, uh, they only get the light uh, when it's noon, right? It it comes directly on top of them. Uh, the other light just doesn't hit them right. But when you have a steep slope like that they get a lot more sun throughout the day. They get a lot more exposure. So again, it allows them to ripen more. Also, being close to the river, the river reflects the light. Um, so any kind of uh, body of water will do that. Uh, but especially here, it's very, very important because again, that light just kind of projects back on the grapes and it, and it makes them uh, produce photosynthesis much better. Um, there are a few other regions that you definitely do need to know about Germany because Riesling, while it is the most recognized grape variety, is definitely not the only one that they, they do. Um, they do quite a bit of red wine, especially since the 1990s. They started producing more and more red wine, um, mainly from uh, Spätburgunder. So Spätburgunder is a German word for for. Pinot Noir, spät meaning late, so it's kind of a late burgundy because it har it um, ripens relatively late. Um, so that's what that's what they also grow there. Um, so in terms of regions, so Mosul, as I mentioned, this one over here, very very important. The other two high quality regions are Rheingau and Rheinhessen. So next to the to the Rhine River, over here. So Rheingau is on the northern side, Rheinhessen on the southern side. Rheinhessen has kind of, is kind of the largest area um, of quality wine. There's a lot of uh, big producers that are based here. Rheingau, on the other hand, is arguably the most advanced. And yeah, they, they have a very interesting system, which I'll get to a little bit later as well, of how to classify their, their top sites. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, other regions that you need to know about, uh, Nye, just kind of on the borders of Rheinhessen and Pfalz. A um, little bit lower in quality, but still very, very good stuff. Nothing that you would uh, throw away. And then Baden, which is a little bit further down south. This is kind of on parallel with where Burgundy is. So the Pinot Noirs from here are absolutely stunning. Um, German Pinot doesn't get any credit. Uh, because it's been kind of late to the party, but there are some absolutely outstanding uh, Pinots from here and great value as well. A hundred pound Pinot from Germany is equivalent to a 2000 pound Burgundy. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. You just need to find them, which is a difficult thing. We actually have a fairly entry level uh, Rheinhessen, uh, Rheinhessen Spätburgunder in M 
So if you're ever interested, go buy it. It's cheap. It's like 25 quid, maybe. Um, anyway, there's plenty of other regions as well, but arguably they're not as important um, or, or not, not that they're not important. You might not find them as much um, <clears throat> in our restaurants around here. Okay. So I was talking about Rango and how they are the most advanced and they have some sort of really interesting classifications. Um, so these classifications are kind of trying to mimic again the Burgundy stuff when they were when they're doing their Premier Cruise and Grand Cruise, and they have Estes Gewachs and Grosses Gewachs, which basically mean kind of first growth, and and Grosses means large, so like a, a like a large growth or a top growth, um, and so you need to have so this is a single vineyard; it needs to be approved it needs to be consistently high in quality and once you get it you get to put these two letters on your bottle gg so sometimes uh winos will talk about gg riesling so if you don't know what that means it means losses it means a grand crew kind of device for some of the best vineyards that you can find in all of all of germany now i don't i mean there's the words in german german is very difficult to learn because the words tend to be a little bit odd um, but there, if you do know a few words in German, it can be very, very easy because what they do is they kind of combine words together. Um, so if you know what individual words mean, you can kind of explain what they mean. And you'll see that later when we talk about um, their, their predicates find classification. Um, the other kind of important classifications they have are Einzelage, Erstelage, and Grosselage. So Lage means, uh, a place, a location. So Erste means first, Grosse means large, and Einze, Einze means uh, specific, kind of. So these three all, all mean kind of a similar thing. So Einzelage means that it's a single vineyard uh, plot. For example, the Schloss Johannesburg, the, the, the chateau that we were talking about in the first place, that is an Einzelage. So on their bottles, they don't have to say the region where the wine comes from. All they have to say is it is a Schloss Johannesburg because it's an Einzelage. It's such an important vineyard that everybody knows what it is and there is no need to put any other region name on top of it. So that's kind of Einzelage just means a super famous single vineyard location. And then Erstelage, like I said, it's like a, a, a premium location in Grosselage means it's a, a Grand Cru location, kind of. Um, now these can be used in other other areas, not just Rheingau, uh, like these guys at the top. Um, and they have some they have some rules. So if you want to be in an Erstelage or a Grosselage, it, it needs to be a certain quality. It needs to be a certain amount of alcohol, sugar um, that you can produce. Um, there's, there's two major cl classifications as, as well about um, German wine. Um, Anna, yeah. question. Uh, so you said the Enzlage is like a single vineyard, Grosslage is like Grand Cru, and Enzlage is like, it's like Premier Cru, or even... A, a kind of, yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the simplest way of explaining it. Again, if you, if you ever take the time and go into German classifications, good luck. They are quite complicated. They have such tiny stipulations that kind of confuse what you mean. And because the words can be a little bit similar, like Erstes Gewachs and Erstelage and Grosses Gewachs and Grosses, they're not interconnected, but they are, but they're not. So yeah, it's uh, a complicated story. Is so, there, is there a, you find on the bottle anyway, all these ones? Yes, yes, it will say on the bottle. So if it's any of these, it will say on the bottle. That's why I kind of, Put them out there again these are kind of the premium stuff uh, that you might find in 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 german wines and at least now you kind of know what they mean uh, basically remember if you ever see this gg you know that you have a super high quality wine same as if you ever see an einzelage uh, written on the label you know that this is absolutely spectacular wine and you can you can trust it that's the idea behind it anyway uh, Next up is the two kind of main, main um, differentiations. By the way, um, these are not connected per se and can some, some are 
within the others, but I'm just trying to explain the, the words uh, that you might find on the bottom. So qualitative sign, uh, bear in mind, I didn't bother writing the German A's with the two dots on top, but yeah, there would be two dots on the top of the A over here, uh, which makes it pronounced as qualitätslein, not qualitätslein. Um, and qualitätslein is basically uh, just a normal classification. It doesn't have um, any particular, um, it just means a, a quality wine. It means a wine that is not um, made for, for, it's not a table wine, let's say. Predicate fine is a little bit more complicated, and this is kind of the thing that everybody tries to teach you about in, in WSETs and everything else, but I always find that people still struggle with it. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about predicate wine and try to understand it. So what is predicate wine? Predicate wine is a classification in, in plain terms, it means the classification of sweetness, but in actual terms, it's a classification of when the grapes are picked. Um, and the first selection or the first picking point is called cabinet. So this would be a normal harvest. So let's say this is the grapes are picked in um, beginning of September. Okay. So this is where you would where where you taste the grapes and they taste like they should. There's nothing spectacular, nothing crazy about them. Still good. In general terms, in sweetness terms, most cabinets will be dry. You can make it slightly sweet, but it won't be a very, very sweet wine. Okay, so in, when people say German Rieslings are always sweet, if they think that, maybe give them a, a dry cabinet and they will change their minds. Now, next one is Spätlese. So, as I said, the German words mean things. Okay, so Lese means harvest. So Lese, the, the four letters over here. And Spät means late. We've heard of Spät before when we talked about Spätburgunder, so a late Burgundy. Here it's a late harvest. Okay, so this is the this is kind of the the, the first um, the first stage of sweetness. Theoretically, a Spätlese can still be dry, but most people will ferment it with a tiny bit of sugar. Um, so these are already kind of more powerful, sweeter styles of wine. The next one is Auschlese. So Auschlese is basically um, a selection of berries uh, after the Spätlese. So uh, in Spätlese, you will kind of uh, take all of the grapes down. Um, and in, in Auschlese, you will just select the really good berries that you want to do, if that makes sense. So it's like a selection, a little bit more meticulous, makes for some more interesting wines you will, I don't think you will find a dry Auschlese. You might somewhere, but I don't think that's the case. Generally, Auschlese, Auschlese, not Auschlese, Auschlese uh, wines tend to be uh, already quite sweet. Next up is Beren Auschlese. As you can see, the word comes with Beren Auslese. Okay, so it's basically this, plus the Beren, and Beren is a German word for raisins, okay? Um, so in this case, it means kind of uh, raisined, raisined special selection. Uh, and this is the selection where the noble rot starts to form. So remember noble rot, the Botrytis cinerea, um, that you can find in Sautern. Uh, it, you can also find it in Germany. So what is this noble rot? So noble rot is basically a, it, it's a rot, However, it can, uh, it basically pierces the skin, the skins of the grapes. So the water starts to leak out and all of the flavors inside of the, of the grape start to concentrate a bit more. The sugars concentrate more um, and you get this kind of a, a gingery, a spicy aroma to the wine. So while it's a rot, it is actually a good rot. That's why it's called the noble rot and it can produce really, really high quality wine. Now you have to be very meticulous, very careful how you do this. Because if you do, because it will generally be mixed with the bad rot as well. So you need to pick the individual berries off of the grapes and be very careful not to put any of the bad rot in the grapes in the wine because you can ruin the whole batch. And yeah, that's why Baron Auschleser tend to be very expensive. Um, they're quite rare as well because the more common one, or not more common one, but the more uh, released one is the next one, which is Trocken Baron Auschleser. And again, if you look at the word, it's lese, it's aus, it's beren, 
but it also has the word trocken in the first place. And trocken in German means dry. So here we have dried berries special selection. Does that make sense? You see, Germans put the words together, it makes it very, very easy to understand if you know what the words mean. So what is the difference between Berenosteise and Trocken Berenosteise is that the Trocken Berenosteise is even later, um, even more noble rot is there. Um, and they tend to be very, very concentrated grapes, very, very dried. So they've let a lot of that water run through, uh, run out of the grapes. Okay. Now these wines are some of the most spectacular wines you might ever get to try. Um, again, the, the complexity that you can find in wines like this is just, is just phenomenal. And, um, Riesling is a grape, so these are generally used for Riesling. Um, Riesling is a very interesting grape because it can produce high acidity regardless of how late it's picked. And this makes it so versatile. That's why you can find Riesling in so many different uh, ways of winemaking, um, from, from dry styles to sparkling wines to super sweet styles and so like that. So um, very, very important to know that Riesling is high in acidity and that acidity is the one that counteracts the sweetness. So in Trocken and Berenhaus Laser, you might find 250 grams of sugar per liter, insane amounts, right? Uh, so that's five Coca-Cola's worth of, of sugar. Um, but it still tastes very, very fresh, and that's because of that acidity that counterbalances it. Okay, and then the last classification of Predicates wine is ice wine. And believe it or not, the words are quite self-explanatory, ice meaning ice and wine meaning wine, so it's an ice wine. Um, how this happens is, so it's very, very rare in Germany. Ice wine is, is produced in Canada almost every year, every year. In, in Germany, it's produced only on the very, very special um, years that they can do this. Now, why can't they do it before? So let's start with, with the noble rot. So if, you want the noble rot to occur, what you need is you need uh, uh, misty mornings, wet mornings that will kind of start off that noble rot. And then during the day, it needs to be dry and relatively warm. So it kind of removes that, that water and it, and it keeps the grapes kind of semi-healthy, semi okay? Now ice wine, you, you cannot have ice wine if there was botrytis there. So ice wine can only happen when you've had very, very dry autumn. And then in the winter, you get an immediate frost. So what I mean by immediate frost is uh, it basically needs to rain and freeze at night. And what this does is that water the, from the rain kind of goes around the grapes, around the berries. Uh, and as it freezes, it, it keeps them inside. So it's kind of like a protection layer that it forms on, uh, on outside of the grapes. And this can only happen in very, very rare occasion, which makes the wine incredibly rare in terms of vintages and even rarer because um, if you can imagine, ice wine is generally picked in late December or January. So by that time, the grapes have been on the vines for a very, very long time. So the water has been pretty much, there's pretty much no water left in it. Um, there's only the, the concentrated sugars that are inside of it. And where they actually get the water is from this ice that was formed on the outside of the grapes. So they leave the ice on the grapes when they do the pressing and that kind of makes the water so they actually get at least a little bit of quantity out of the wine. Because as you can imagine, there's no juice, there's no water, you won't get any, any, any uh, quantity out of the wine. So ice wine, absolutely spectacular, incredibly rare. Good luck finding it. Um, if you do treasure it, it can age for a million years and it will still be delicious again because of that acidity and that concentration. And yeah, and that's it. So this Let, is, the, yes. The ice one, we serve it at M is not for sale, no? Well, we serve it at M in general, but we have the Canadian one. So. Ah, okay. So it's not for German. For no, we can't afford the German one. Okay. Thank you. Again, like I said, because Canada has um, a, a more simple climate in terms of it, it's drier for longer, they can produce ice wine pretty consistently. Um, and the one that we have is from Stratus and they are located next to the Niagara Lakes, uh, Niagara Falls. Um, so 
basically when it's when it's time to freeze so the area is actually dry but they get a lot of that uh, spray from from the actual lakes they get a lot of water when, when the wind winds come and it kind of allows them to produce it um, pretty consistently um, which makes it relatively cheap as well so it's a it's a good value uh, ice wine the one that we have but yeah german one very ra very rare um, wine geeks tend to be pretty excited when it's an ice wine year uh, they kind of lust for it <coughs> which is you know weird but anyway so predicate swine remember it because it's not only germans that use it a lot of the countries that we're going to talk about um, in the next session as well adopted a similar system um, because this is the easiest way to kind of explain to people what it is um, Schloss Johannesburg, the, the castle we're talking about, when they invented this, um, they, they were also aware that they need to communicate this somehow. So they developed a system of uh, changing the caps on top of the wine. So even today, you might see some, some wineries um, that will still have different colored caps for different types of sweetness. So um, I think a white cap means dry, uh, a gold cap means super sweet. There's a yellow cap. There's a pink cap. So there's a few different uh, colors that can tell you what the what the wine, what the sweetness of the wine is as well. So um, feel free to do some research on that. It's quite quite an interesting thing. Okay, but let's move on uh, to finish up with Germany. Uh, we do need to talk about some of the more important uh, wine wine makers. Um, in my view, in my mind, the most the most spectacular wine that I've ever had from Germany uh, was this one on the bottle uh, in the picture. So it is an Egenmuller 1976 Riesling uh, Spätlese. Absolutely. I mean, this was an orgasmic wine. Um, the layers of complexity, the freshness, the, the aromatic character that was still there was absolutely phenomenal. And Egenmuller is an, it's an old, family owned estate. I think they've been around for five or six generations now. Um, and yeah, they've just consistently pr produced some of the more, the most spectacular wines um, around the world. Uh, probably the, the most expensive as well because they're, uh, they're very sought after. It, you, you can be very lucky if you ever get to, um, to drink some of their wines. Um, the other important ones, JJ Prune as well. Um, and there's, there's the famous three doctors. You have Dr. Tanish, Dr. Birklin Wolf, and Dr. Lozen. Um, especially Dr. Lozen, I think, is it's in every WSET book that I've ever read. Uh, they, they talk about him. Um, and one of my personal favorites as well, uh, Marcus Molitor. Marcus Molitor was famous for um, buying the vineyards that nobody could cultivate. So as I mentioned before, um, the German vineyards are very, very steep. Most of them have to be harvested by hand because there is no way a, a tractor can uh, can get up that hill. Uh, but Marcus Molitor took it even further. He bought he bought land, not vineyards. He bought land that nobody else would want to cultivate. So he got it cheap because it was so bloody steep. Sometimes it's like it's like that. You need you need climbing gear to to go into his vineyards. Um, and he bought those vineyards, and yeah, he just kind of put 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 himself on the map and and put these areas on the map so a lot of people started kind of following in his stead as well um he's one of those people that that use this cap system as well so he has um uh, white white labels and gold labels and stuff like that really good stuff okay so any questions about the germans is the house wine can be produced every year or the which the house is it? No, the ice wine. Ice, ice, no, ice that's, wine. What, that's what I was saying. Because it is, it needs to be absolutely perfect. They cannot produce it every time. And in in general terms, you can only pr you could you should only be able to produce either the Trockenberger or Schlesier, or for short, to it's called TBA. Most people will just call it uh, TBA. Um, you can either, either produce TBA or an ice wine. You cannot produce both because the conditions are different for, for the development of each of them. So like I said, ice wine, I think in the last 10 years, there's been two vintages that, that allowed for ice wine. So very, very rare. You cannot do it all the time. Anything else, guys, for Germany? 
All right. So let's go to the Austrians. So the Austrians are the baby Germans kind of, but not really. They have, um, they've always had influences from uh, the other neighboring countries as well, which was one of them, obviously Slovenia, as we know, woohoo. Um, and the other were, were the Hungarians. Um, so in spite of them having kind of um, a cultural association with the Germans in terms of winemaking, they were always looking a little bit more to the East and the South. Um, but anyway, they're his historically, um, they weren't really regarded as a, as a premium winemaking country. They were mostly making uh, wines for export to Germany, uh, mostly for bulk production and things like that. Um, but when they finally became famous, it became for the very, very wrong reasons. Um, so in 1985, there was a, an investigation in their wines. So what happened? So the Austrians were producing these bulk wines that weren't really impressive, weren't really, really good. Um, there was a few bad vintages. There was over, over, produ over production all over the place. Uh, so some donkeys had a great idea of kind of enhancing the flavors of the wines. Uh, so they basically added a component, uh, a chemical component to the wines to bring up the alcohol a little bit and bring up the sweetness a little bit. Um, and this was a co component that can actually be found in antifreeze. So antifreeze, the, the thing you put in the car. Uh, so there's a, a little thing called some sort of glycol that I'm not going to remember, of course, the first part of it. Um, but yeah, they started putting that into the wines and that thing is actually poison. Um, basically, they, they assessed that anything over 40 grams of that component in a, in a bottle of wine uh, can, be, can, can kill you. Um, now, in most of the wines that they tested, it was less than 40 grams, so it wasn't life-threatening, but still, as you can imagine, if you drink tiny bits of poison for a long time, long period of time, it can be quite harmful. So they did have some deaths in that time. Um, and yeah, this made the Austrians famous for the very, very wrong reasons like cheating and so on. But they, they didn't take that, uh, they didn't take that and, and fled or whatever, but they've turned it around. So first in 1986, they started this new, uh, new business of uh, promoting um, Austrian wines. They've put in new um, new rules on how they're going to test things and how they're going to improve the quality. They stopped overproducing. They started focusing more on quality. Um, they've been investing very, very hard. I can tell you for a fact, even in like all of the education programs that I've been into, WSCT, Court of Masters Familiars, they invest a lot of money uh, so that their history is properly represented. Um, so they're, they, they're not running away from the antifree scandal, but they've chose to embrace it and they've started to, um, to try to change people's minds and show them how great their wines are. So, and they've done that very, very successfully. I have to say in the last 30 years since then, uh, their wines have been on a constant rise and they are slowly, slowly getting uh, where, they, where they can be because they do have some areas that produces some of the most spectacular wines in the world. So what are these areas? So, First of all, this is Austria. As you can see, it borders Germany in the Northeast. It's borders Slovakia, it borders Hungary, um, Slovenia, and Italy. Now, like I said, their influences weren't really that much from the Germans. Their influences came from uh, Hungary and, and from Slovenia. So you can see where the vineyards are mostly concentrated. Obviously, there, there would be some influences from Slovakia as well, but Slovakians were never that much into, into wine. Um, beer was always their main thing. So a few regions that you definitely need to know, uh, the three here, the Kampstall, Kremstall, and Wachau. And Wachau, we will go a little bit more into detail because I, I think it's, it's, the, it's the Burgundy of Austria. Uh, Wagram, very important as well. And then Burgenland over here that borders Hungary. Burgenland is the only region that is uh, predominantly uh, red or that is famous for the reds. In terms of grapes, the main grape is a grape called Grüner Veltliner, so the green Veltliner. Um, they also make some Riesling. You can find some other grapes. You can find some Chardonnay, some Sauvignon Blanc, and things like that, but in very, very tiny, um, 
tiny quantities. Generally, they will focus on Gruner and to a lesser extent reasoning as well. In terms of red, they, they try to own the Blau Frankish, but we'll talk more about that next week. Um, there is a grape called uh, Saint Laurent as well. Saint Laurent is a French grape that made its way uh, over the Alps, um, through Switzerland, over the Alps uh, to Austria and Italy. Um, and Blau Frankish and, and Saint Laurent uh, together, they form a grape called Zweigelt. Now Zweigelt is named after a scientist that, that made it, but because he was a devout Nazi, uh, I choose to believe that the, the name for this grape actually means what the words mean. So in German, Geld with a D though means gold and Zwei means two. So I always say that Zwei Geld means the two golds as in the two golden grape varieties, which are the Blau Frankisch and Saint Laurent. So Blau Frankisch, it is kind of a, if you wanted to compare it to other grape varieties, it would be, it would sit kind of in the Merlot Cabernet Franc style. It's got that blue fruity uh, vivaciousness. It can be quite big in body. It can be light and fresh. So it's kind of depending on where you grow it. Saint Laurent, a little bit more like a Pinot, a little bit more elegant, but it can, if you produce, if you macerate it for a long time, it can produce quite highly extracted wines as well. So quite interesting. Okay. Now, Vajau. So Vajau is up here, okay? And it is arguably the most important uh, region in Austria because it is the, is, like I said, it's kind of the Burgundy of Austria. Um, and they know this, so they've actually done their own little classification that doesn't really uh, apply anywhere else. And it is based on Klostenburger Mostwagen. Great, another German word. Basically, it means the, the, the weight of the must, uh, so of the grapes. And based on that Mostwagen, they have classified wines into three quality um, ranks, let's say. And these quality ranks are the ones that you see in the picture. Uh, one is Steinfeder, Federspiel, and Smaragd. Um, don't need to really know what I mean. I mean, Federspiel means the Falcon. You can see them on the picture um, on the left. So the reason why they um, why I posted the picture is because this is what you will find on the bottles. So if you ever see a Steinfeder on the bottle, that means that the Gruner Veltliner or the Riesling that they produce in Wachau area can be spritzig. So spritzig means uh, spritzig, not spritzing. Um, it is a little bit sparkling and it cannot have more than 11.5% of alcohol. So in theory, if you see Steinfeder on a bottle of Austrian wine, it means that it's a very light style of wine. Federspiel is the Falcon uh, in Vaha. They've, they've always been famous for their, for their falconry. Um, you know, it's when they have their little gloves and the Falcon comes back and forth, whatever. Um, and this means that the wine is somewhere between 11.5% and 12.5% and of alcohol. So it's kind of a medium body, uh, Gruner. The most important one, arguably, is the Smaragd. So Smaragd is the name of this guy in the back. So this is this beautiful lizard that lives in the vineyards of Ajo. Um And yeah, it's so exceptional. They've decided to name their most premium, the most interesting wines that they can produce uh, with that Smaragd label. Um, the wines need to be a minimum of 12.5%, but generally, most of these Gruner Veltliners or Rieslings will be 14 and a half percent very rich very full-bodied Gruner in general has this quite a floral and a white peppery spicy aroma really really good stuff of wines um, generally relatively high in acidity as well um, kind of a it's kind of a more serious Riesling let's say so if Riesling tends to be it can be elegant but it's always a little bit on the playful side uh, Gruner is never playful it is a very serious but but elegant at the same time it's just kind of a, like a very polished grape um so yeah smaragd definitely remember don't really need to know the other two i mean they generally if you have a if you if you are in Vaho, you will do your best to produce a smaragd wine because it just is the best obviously the wines are dry smaragd if you want to make a wine 14 and a half percent of alcohol in that area there is no way there's going to be any sweetness left in it. Okay, so that's Vajau. 
this is it on the picture. So this is the village of Ahau. You can see beautiful vineyards as well. I mean, um, that's the that's the magic of wine as well. It's never grown in ugly places, right? It's only only ever grown in some of the most beautiful ones. Um, in terms of icons, yeah, the arguably the most important um, guy for the name of Austrian wines was Epix Pichler. I always thought his name was Felix, but no, his name is is Franz Franz Xaver Xavier something like that Pichler. Um, yeah, he is famous for ma making single vineyard uh, gruners and rieslings in in Wahau. Uh, he was one of the main guys that kind of pushed for this classification of the three, the Finnish Bill, the Smaragd. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's one of the hundred pointers that, that, that makes Austria uh, great in terms of wine. Um, Emily Noll and Franz Hitzberger, they both also uh, produce a lot of wine in, in Wachau and Kamtal and Kremstal, so in those three regions that, that were touching each other. <clears throat> and then Willy Opitz, uh, I wanted to mention uh, Willy or Victoria, which is his daughter, which is in charge now. Um, <clears throat> they are based in Burgenland, so the, the region I was talking about that borders Hungary, and there's a lot of um, red wine there. So they're famous for their beautiful Blau Frankish and Zweigelt wines, and also Pinot Noir. <clears throat> and particularly Willy Opitz, um, as some M people might remember, we used to have it on the wine list. We had a Berenhausleser uh, Spätburgunder, so Berenhausleser Pinot Noir, uh, which means that it was a noble rot, uh, red sweet wine <clears throat> that they produced. And it was quite spectacular. It was something I've never tried before. Uh, I tried it from them. So um, quite a ballsy move from them to try to do it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I German and Austrian wine tends to be a little bit more complicated because of the, the the weird words so I don't want to go too much in detail but yeah I think we've covered kind of the main things for today so questions guys uh, questions um, so we talk about Riesling, Grunewald Trina, uh, Pinot Noir they don't have any Grevustramina in there no Germany no Austria nothing they do they do they do a lot of uh, Tramina as well but in comparison, so Austria, I think 36% of all of the vineyards are Gruner. Um, and then Riesling is like 12%. And then, you know, the Traminer will be one and a half, two percent. Uh, so are they using, they using always as a blend, the Traminer? Or they no, 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 I'm not talking about blends. I'm talking about the quantity of vineyards planted oh, with oh, it. Oh, production, okay. Yeah, so um, the, Austrians aren't that into blending. There is one region um, in, in Vienna, actually, in the Vienna wine region uh, around the city, that they are famous for their um, gemischt wines, so their, their mixed wines, which, you, which are quite interesting as well. Um, basically, just a blend of anything that grows there. It can be Pinot Blanc, it can be Silvaner, it can be Müller Thurgau, uh, Traminer, you know, anything that they can find. There's a lot of Muscat as well. If we, if we go back to the to the um, to the map, you see like in the Südsteiermark, so in the in the southern Steier area, you can find some Sauvignon Blanc, Muscat Blanc, and um, Pinot Blanc. So there's many grapes that they grow, but like I said, I do want to focus on the ones that make the difference. If we if we can if we can say that, mm -hmm. um, okay. okay. But yeah, so Gemischter Satz, so white wine blends here in the Vienna area. Anything else, guys? Any other questions? Anything about Germany? Yes, yeah, somebody's got a question. You don't believe the story of kidnapping? <laughs> well, you don't have to. There's, I mean, look. Why would why would a courier be two weeks late somewhere? Maybe he he met a girl and fell in love and wanted to get married, and then and then she came out of her shell and showed who she really was. So he finally ran away after two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, and he regrets it, and he went back to work. Yeah. But I don't believe that story. Well, it's a legend. So there's, um, I think there there's two official variants. One variant is that the 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 owner was actually out hunting, and they couldn't find him, 
Um, so that's why he couldn't come and yeah, the other one was that, that he was held by bank robbers. Um, it's not so far-fetched to be honest because there were, obviously this was in the 17th century, there, there wasn't as many laws as there are today. So there were, um, you know, barbarians trolling the roads and so on. Um, so it's possible. I like that idea. I like that. I actually played like a yes. <laughs> Sorry? You like the idea. Well, I, I, I like the story behind it. The legends are what makes it interesting, right? So I always, I always uh, thought that what actually happened was that uh, some of the rival uh, wineries wanted to hurt the guy uh, because they didn't want them to produce a good wine so they could get a bigger market share or whatever. Uh, and that they did it. So it could be that. It could be that the locals knew that they were going to get the grapes if it's going to be shit wine. Uh, and they did it. So it's many, many stories. It's it's in 17th century. There's not going to be there's not going to be a, an accurate story to that, is it? Yeah. Probably it's the girl thing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah. Cool. Anything else, guys? Any other any other questions or disputes of legends? Leonard. Yes. Did the Nazi occupation in the 40s have any impact on the Austrian production or vineyards? Um, yes, uh, in Austria and in Germany, obviously. Especially Germany, the Schloss Johannesburg we were talking about, it was actually demolished in 1942 uh, when there were bombing mines. Um, but yes, obviously, same as most of the world, um, these areas were heavily occupied, so people weren't really uh, doing anything uh, in the vineyards. They, they weren't able to. Um, so yeah. It was, it was an effect, but again, there weren't such big players in the world of wine anyway. Most of their wine was consumed locally. Um, so yeah, they weren't really, um, you know, they, you wouldn't, I, they weren't as massively affected. I mean, they were affected by many things, same as everybody else. They had phylloxera as well. They had uh, all of these kind of diseases and, and they just came back. Um, but again, I don't, there's no point in focusing on these negatives because they're not the ones that hurt them. What hurt them was their approach to winemaking. The, the, the volume first approach, that was wrong. Um, and then obviously trying to trick people, um, for Austrians I'm talking about, um, with that antifreeze thing, that, that's what hurt them. So anything else can, can be a factor, but yeah. Ultimately, is if you look at the French, right? The French had their words. They never waned from quality. They were in, the French were never famous for their bulk production. Right? They're, they're famous for their premium quality wines. And the reason for it is the mentality, the way you want to go into it. So yeah, people can blame it on many things, but I don't think there's any escaping your mentality. Yeah. Anything else, guys? I have maybe a stupid question. Good. Cover. Does the German maybe make any sparkling wine? Yes, they do. Uh, they make a sparkling wine called Sekt. Um, it can be produced from, um, well, the, it's a weird one. It's mostly uh, locally consumed because, let's face it, it's not very high quality. Um, we'll actually, we'll do, we'll, do, we'll do a special sparkling wine session and we'll do the champagne that, that you asked about earlier we'll do sect we'll do cava we'll do prosecco and moscato and cap classic and so on and perfect we'll talk about all of the different things that uh, was my yes, next question generally you won't find german sparkling wine in london uh if you do it's gonna say sect on it uh, sometimes it's produced with riesling yeah, which makes it quite aromatic and fresh but it's not really high quality Mm. And is which method? The German method. What, <laughs> what do you mean? It can be it can be traditional method or it can be a Charmat method. They can they don't have a particular rule for that. All right. Thank you. They do whatever they want. Eh? <laughs> well, kind of, yeah. I mean, they have other rules that that come into play. But yeah, basically, it can be grown anywhere in Germany. It's generally lower quality fruit. Uh, yeah. Anything else, guys? No. Okay. So, like I said, next Tuesday, the big, the big one, we're gonna talk about the most beautiful country in the world, uh, 
and how it influenced the world of wine. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about other countries as well. So Hungary, Croatia, and I think we're going to touch on Greece as well. Um, but being Slovenian, I will definitely milk the opportunity to rant. Um, so yeah, hope. Okay, guys, the, 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 the presentation is already up, so feel free to download it. Uh, the video will be up as usual in about three, four hours. Uh, so you can go back to it if you missed anything. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.